and welcome back to Florida Foodie. I'm your host, Candace Campos, along with our producer extraordinaire, Thomas Mates. And wine is such a big business across the U.S. There are more than 10,000 wineries in the U.S., according to the National Association of American Wineries. According to the Association, though, of African-American vineyards, there are only about 70 wineries that are Black-owned. So today we are speaking with the first Black woman to own a winery here in the state of Florida. We're so excited to talk to her, Desiree Noisette, the owner of Mermosa Wines. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. So, okay, for, for somebody who just doesn't know what M- Mermosa kind of stands for, give us a little bit of background because I know there's a lot of meaning within that name. Oh, there's, there's a lot. So just on, <laughs> on kind of a very surface level, we are a wine brand um, and we are, our corporate office is in Florida. And um, my name again is Desiree Noisette. So I'm the founder, creator, mastermind behind Mermosa. We are the official wines of boats, brunch, and beaches. Um, and just, uh, you know, kind of a uh, layer deeper, Mermosa is a tribute to my, my heritage, my family heritage. Our family's first mermaid it was Celestine Noisette, and she was a Black Haitian woman who grew up in, in Haiti. It was actually before Haiti was Haiti, but she grew up there in the late 1700s, and she fell in love with a white Frenchman named Philippe Noisette. And there's a, there's a lot more to this, to this story, but it's, um, it's a love story. It involves forbidden love across color lines. Celestine at one point was forced to be a slave along with her kids, and eventually she, um, she used her powerful voice to free herself from slavery and her kids. I mean, that is just such a powerful, <laughs> it's such a powerful background to, to a wine. And for those who are wondering, what type of wine are we looking at here? We're looking at uh, sparkling wines. We've got some really beautiful, um, ready to drink wine, co- they're not cocktails, but wine um, styles. Um, one is called Mermosa. And this is a really beautiful white wine. We use grapes from Pacific Northwest. And then I add a little bit of real orange and pineapple juice right before we filter. So it's refreshing. It's actually low sugar, only four grams of sugar per serving. And um, it's it's the perfect mimosa. Uh, I love it. We're mermaids, so it's mermosa. And then we have merseco, which is our mermaids version of a prosecco. It's a a really uh, elegant, well balanced, sparkling white wine. Again, using grapes from Pacific Northwest. Um, it also has no sugar in it, less than a gram of sugar. And what's really nice is it's fruit forward, so it doesn't feel like it's got no sugar. And then I've got a rosé called Celestine Rosé that is paying homage to um, to our siren Celestine. It's a Pinot Noir Pinot Gris blend, also a bubbly wine. I mean, so let's let's talk about from. I mean, were you, were you like when you were born and you were just kind of born in the winery world, or is this something <laughs> that you you found? Because I, I was looking back and you have a little bit of law background, so I don't know how wine and law combined, but because, <laughs> tell us that you'd be, su- you'd be surprised. <laughs> That's true. You, you really would be surprised. Um, you know, a, a lot of business gets done at happy hours that involve wine. When that is very law. true. <laughs> in fact, my first my first trip to a winery was when. I was an intern at a law firm in North Carolina. And we went to, uh, as one of our excursions, we went to a winery based in North Carolina. Um, And that was my first, I just, I fell in love with it then. I was already really interested in wine. Uh, I did not grow up in the wine world, uh, (laughs) unfortunately. Um, You know, my my kids are lucky enough to to grow up in the wine world, but not not me. Um, But the part that always fascinated me was, was how, wine connects people. And when you are learning about wines, it feels like you're traveling. Sometimes you're traveling through time. Sometimes you're, you know, traveling to another part of the world, or you're just, you know, learning about the winemakers family and you're sitting, it feels like you're sitting in their kitchen learning about their, you know, family heritage. So, um, so yes, I, I, I did not grow up in the wine world. (laughs) Law kind of, I guess, brought me into it. I dipped my toe in. Yeah. And then um, I stopped practicing law in 2012 at, at a firm in Tampa. And I 
jumped ship and I went and opened a swimwear store in downtown St. Pete, Florida. And, <laughs> and um, one of the things that I would do to make swimwear shopping fun, um, other than having really great lighting, swimwear for all body types for women, I started serving wine. And when I wow. popped the bottles, it was like a party was starting. So imagine instead of going in and expecting to dread your experience, going in and feeling like, oh, I'm gonna have a party. Right. Um, so that that's really what got me into the mode of, I need to create some wines that bring this experience to life. Were you doing this uh, like winemaking? Were you doing it like personally for yourself, just sort of like an at home kind of thing at first, or, or did you just kind of like dive in head first and think this is gonna be, this is the next business I'm going to start. I dove in. I dove in dove for in. sure. I had the the concept and I talked with my my husband, of course, and he gave the green light. I have lots of lots of ideas. Um, <laughs> and he's I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a, a serial entrepreneur. I have lots of ideas. Um, but he's kind of my first gatekeeper when right. I have a, a concept. <laughs> and if his question is is something along the lines of, um, I, I think his question to me was, okay, well, let's talk about distribution. Right. That was his, that was his mm -hmm. first question. I mean, I was like, aha, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think, I think this, this really might be something that excites and connects with people. So after that, I uh, talked with my brother-in-law. He used to work at a wine, a couple wineries out in New Zealand. And so he knew more about the winemaking process than I did. This was several years ago. And so he kind of gave me a rundown of the process and he told me how I could get my hands on grapes and you know how I could get those next steps together. Um, and then I just started researching like crazy. And I just picked up the phone and started calling wineries. It was kind of wild. I would call places in California. Um, and in general, my idea of infusing wine, really nice wines with orange and pineapple juice was, wasn't everybody's cup of tea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I got to page six of a Google search in <laughs> Oregon, that's deep. That's deep. You know, who stays on page six <laughs> of a Google search? I found an Oregon wine press article. It's a, a blog out there. That's more very like localized industry specific. And there was an article about this guy who had just bought this amazing mobile bottling line that could uh, carbonate the way we needed the wines to be carbonated. And they made the mistake of putting his cell phone number in the article. Uh-oh. <laughs> picked up the phone and I called him. There comes he it off. <laughs> yeah, he, we hit it off. He was really excited about the concept. He invited me out to his home to learn how to do formulations. Um, his name is Joe Dobbs, and he owns, I believe it's the second largest wine operation in Oregon. Wow. And um, he's a pioneer in the wine industry, and he really educated me. He helped me find a, a winery operation that could manufacture the product. Um, when we, we used to contract manufacture, we don't anymore. We do it um, in-house now, um, but, you know, just... I picked up the phone and I called people and I guess I, I got lucky and I talked to the right people. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and Thomas was asking, you know, did you dive head first? And then you're like, yeah, I don't head first. It was like, it, <laughs> it wasn't a doubt in your mind. And I, I feel like, especially a woman and a woman of color trying to start a business, especially a business that doesn't have a lot of women, <laughs> you know, leading the forefront. Did you find do you find yourself kind of like hitting a lot more obstacles than maybe a, a man would have to? Uh, yeah, yes, I do think so. And I think there's, there's several reasons for it, but I think that I need to distinguish the obstacles that I faced were more, they weren't from the wine industry. Yeah. They were from um, consumer perceptions and also um, investor potential investor perceptions. Really? Yes. So, uh, you know, I had folks straight up tell me, you're crazy to do this. <laughs> what do you mm -hmm. think? You've got no, no background, you know, but I, I think if, if maybe I looked a little different and had a different upbringing, then it wouldn't be so much of a surprise um, to, to people. So um, there was a lot of doubt from folks that 
um, that I eventually talked to as potential investors. And so, um, you know, that's that was one side. Access to capital is a huge issue for people of color in this industry. I mean, and, and we've, we've heard that a lot from a lot of business owners, especially, you know, kind of going, I mean, we were diving a lot more um, with our new station, you know, Black History Month and realizing black owned businesses, that was one of their biggest hurdles to get through was just finding the capital to back them up. It's true. And I, you know, one of the um, unfortunate uh, repercussions of me not growing up in the wine industry is that I don't have these years and years of relationships with folks mm -hmm. that I can put on my board, um, have as advisory councils. Those are all part of the um, capital financing analysis for banks and lending institutions. It's a really big part of it, actually. Mm -hmm. So if, if you know you have people who are already part of your organization, that have been there, done that before, or um, have been training you and are you know putting their names on the line. That's something that makes a really big difference. Um, and obviously, I don't come from that world, so um, and most people of color don't, and there are mm -hmm. lots of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that's one side, and then there was a uh, consumer um, uh, barrier, uh, maybe more a uh, distributor barrier. Um, because of where I'm located, I'm in, you know, I'm in Florida. There aren't that many wineries here. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm a, a woman of color that doesn't have a big name in the industry. It was hard to get distributors to look at me. Mm -hmm. And I can't sell my product if I don't have a distributor. By law, I'm required to use distributors. So, I mean, so how did you accomplish that? I mean, people, you kept getting kind of the door slammed in your face and you said, it's fine. It's fine. I'm going to handle this. Well, I came, I actually, I came up with a um, kind of a roundabout way so I could sell direct to consumer to start. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me build an, uh, a presence. And then I was able to use that presence to bring in a brand manager that really had a lot of experience and she has a lot of uh, clout in the industry and she was able to help me get those meetings with distributors. Um, so I really had to um, pay my dues, mm -hmm. find people that would help, that believed in what I was trying to do and, and what I was trying to create. And then they helped me get make those connections. Yeah. How long did that process take between, you know, starting to, okay, I had the idea, now I need the capital, eventually you had the capital, now I need the distributors, like how, what, what was the, the time frame on all of that? <laughs> okay, so the capital part, um, part of that, talking to my husband, I put a business <laughs> in like we, we have that initial discussion and he's like, okay, well, let's talk about distribution. I'm like, hold on, let me write my business plan. So I put my business plan together. That took a couple months. This was 2017. Um, and then once I had it together, um, I sat down with him and I said, listen, our neighbors just put their house on the market and it sold in two days and they got a ridiculous price for it. What do you think if we sell our house, oh move our two small children i have one that i was i had just less than a year old he was only nine months old at the time yeah Ten months old. so easy to move them <laughs> yeah move yeah. right move them to let's go rent some place with our dog and uh use all that money to buy a truckload of wine and he really said yes your money where your mouth is <laughs> he said yes <laughs> wow uh, so um you know i used i used our existing um kind of windfall in real estate for, for our house to, to kickstart everything. And then once um, that happened, I was able to leverage that initial investment to bring in some more loans and then eventually capital. Do you where, have- Where, I'm sorry, I just, where did the confidence come from to think like, <laughs> this is gonna work, I'm gonna sell my house. <laughs> Celestine? Yeah, Audacity? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, this woman was so, I mean, I think it's, I think it's generational in our blood, but um, just to kind of tell you a little bit more about her story. So she marries Philippe, they get married in Haiti, and then they go to Charleston, South Carolina. And in Charleston, Philippe is forced to claim Celestine and the kids as slaves. Wow. Comes up with this fake bill of sale. He forges it, 
so that they don't get, so they don't get sold off to they would get taken away and sold to a plantation you can't yeah. you couldn't at the time be just a, a black person running around charleston without being owned or papers having papers so anyway there she's now a slave then he goes and he petitions the state of south carolina for their emancipation it's a really beautiful like love letter and the state says no so he gets to work he becomes kind of famous for creating a rose he's a, a botanist and he introduces a rose that's called the Noisette Rose. They're still growing in Charleston. It's really, it's amazing. I'm going and on a trip to Charleston soon, so I'm gonna look out for oh, those. Oh yeah, they're, um, when you go to the, just down on Meeting Street, which is right in the middle of town, there's a performing arts center and there's a garden right in front and that, that's the Noisette Memorial Garden. So you can see them, they'll be blooming. They'll be blooming right now, it'll be perfect. Oh my gosh, I'll Yeah, they're blooming all over. I got some at my house and they're just exploding. They're, they smell so good. So um, so anyway, then when Philippe dies, he has this will that says to the executor, sell everything, give the money to Celestine, and then sneak her and the kids up to a Northern state where they can be free. Oh my gosh. So he, I mean, they just had this passionate, this yes. amazing love story. But what mm. Celestine did, um, this is where her audacity comes in. Mm -hmm. She told the executor no. And she said, no, I'm not leaving. She was part of the business. She was part of this whole um, operation. They had land in Charleston. And it wasn't like today we can just pick up and get on a plane and leave. I mean, she would literally be sneaking her kids and she had seven kids sneaking them up to a Northern, it just, it didn't make sense. So she told him no. And the executor created a legal structure that allowed her Celestine and the kids to remain in Charleston as free people of color. And then eventually the kids did get their full documented freedom. So she just had this powerful voice. And I, I think that this has come down through the generations. I feel a sense of her audacity. She's our mermaid in our logo. And, um, you know, she was able to use her voice to break free from slavery. I think I can sell my house and start a wine brand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it feels so it feels so simple when you compare right. it, compare it to yeah. that story, right? Yeah. It's just, I mean, it, it's just so remarkable. And um, you spoke with Amanda Castro um, for Women's History Month, and and she was spotlighting yeah. you. And you said something about every bottle that you sell has a little bit of audacity in it. It does. It has a piece of Celestine's voice that mm -hmm. audacity. Oh my God. We were even saying that uh, when you're reaching out to other like vintners that they, you know, you told them your idea and they kind of turned up their nose and in the very like bougie wine fashion you might imagine, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have to think that this, that this is your, your idea and, and your brand kind of like push back against that, that. Sticking it to them, right? Yeah. That snobbish demeanor of, of, of wineries, you know? I mean, it, it, uh, it certainly feels good to have the consumer validation now mm -hmm. that I've been out, you know, we've, we have ratings, you know, we have um, more backing now and distribution. We're with um, one of the largest distributors in the nation. So, um, you know, jokes on them because we could have worked together. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, it all works out the way it's supposed to. I, I just have a really great team and it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't gone down the path that right. I went down. Right. I mean, what would you tell somebody who might be listening, thinking whether it's a winery or found out that there's no really women owned breweries here in Florida? I mean, what would you tell? A, a Is that true? That's true. Yeah. We just did a story about for Women's History Month, you know, women owned breweries. And although there's a lot of brewmasters and things like that, that are women uh, locally here, there, there's not a lot like in the central Florida area. So, I mean, what would you, what, what advice would you give other women, other black women looking kind of to break into, into this, this world? I mean, I know beer and wine are two completely different worlds, but uh, mm. I mean, what, what advice would you give them? Just pick up the phone and start calling people, read articles um, by the, if you're in wine, the sommeliers, beard, I don't know what it's called. I'm sure there's something like a sommelier. Is there is a sommelier? I think so. I yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think beer master I is beer. or brew master. You don't drink beer. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I really don't. Water, you don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that it is my drink of choice. So um, yeah, I just but read articles. There are a ton of people, especially um, with COVID, 
happening. Mm -hmm. People are doing these Instagram lives and clubhouse meetings and Facebook pages are just blowing up with actual engagement. Uh, and these are not just industry groups, but um, for example, there are some wine lover groups that I'm part of mm -hmm. and it's full of industry people and everyday people that just love talking and just see who the, the people are that are having conversations and reach out. And if there's something you want to learn, they can give you tips. You'll find your, your people, you'll find your community. And I think that there's a big misconception that, um, that it is, especially in the wine world, that it's all full of snobs. Mm -hmm. And one of my missions is to demystify the wine world. And I think there are a lot of people um, in my generation that are doing that, that just, we, we don't, it's not that we don't appreciate the legacies, but I think that um, we recognize that things should be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And so demystifying this snobbiness, um, you know, idea of snobbiness in the wine world is, is I think on the forefront in, in a lot of ways in wine. I hope beer too. Although I don't think beer is really seen as snobby. I don't, I don't know. Think, I don't it think so. Be. I guess it could be. It can be. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're talking to someone who, Thomas from the Pacific Northwest. I mean, they they yeah. know their wine, oh, yeah. they know their beers. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, where are you from? Uh, well, I'm, I'm originally from Pennsylvania actually, but I, we, most recently uh, before coming to Florida, I was in Portland, Oregon for three years and Ah. Yes, there are certainly uh, plenty of, of beer snobs out there, uh, and and you know wine wine as well as, as you know. You said you 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 trained with uh, someone from yep. the Pacific Northwest, and and honestly, yes. I, I didn't even know Oregon had such a a wine heritage that the Willamette Valley was such a thing. You know, you always think of like Northern California and Sonoma and, and those areas, mm -hmm. um, but the Willamette Valley is like its own world of, of wine and and uh you know vine yes. uh, vineyards and everything like that so uh, it's Amazing. it's interesting to me that 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 i mean knowing what i know of oregon it's not as surprising to me that someone would hear you say like here's my idea and you know this non-traditional idea that they would be like okay yeah let's do that yes you know <laughs> it was the perfect fit it really was and i have to say i have not experienced any wine snobbery in oregon for mm -hmm. for what it's worth I, I just don't think it's the style Right. Mm -hmm. Valley, when you go there, you'll see that, um, you know, these, the, the tasting rooms are, mm -hmm. uh, there are a few that are palatial, but most of them are, they're like operating agricultural yeah. endeavors mm -hmm. and they're farms. These are, yeah. you know, uh, winemakers and people running vineyards are very sophisticated farmers, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, but they're farmers at heart. So yeah. I, I really didn't experience that. And it was beautiful. And, I mean, and your wines behind you look beautiful. And I love how you're kind of trying to break the barrier of kind of this, you know, snobby, you know, but I feel like also adding a little bit of fruits. And, and I mean, that's so Florida, you know, yes. <laughs> have that Florida feel where it's just so hot to drink anything that's not refreshing. Um, I mean, what, yes. why, why those fruits? What, what is it about them? So with Mermosa, we add the orange and the pineapple juice. Mm -hmm. And I did somewhere around like 300 taste tests, direct to consumer taste tests to find out what was the perfect formulation. So I went through maybe 30 different versions and some were all orange juice, some were all pineapple juice. And then the formulation that I ended up using um, uses a little bit of both. And that's just what, what people wanted and found the most refreshing. And my tastings were during the daytime, but it was really <laughs> hot. So I was getting the authentic um, mm -hmm. you know, experience. I, I wanted it to be refreshing. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, that's the Mermosa. Our other wine styles, they don't infuse anything. They're just true, true wines. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But Mermosa, yeah, that's a formula wine. I'm really proud of how that came out. Which one's your favorite? I know, I know it's like a mother asking her who her favorite child is, but if you had to pick one that you, that you were in the mood for. Um, she has her hands on her head. She's stressing out. I, I'm like, <laughs> yes, you are. You're making me pick my favorite child. Okay, Celestine Rosé okay. is my favorite. And it might have to do with the time of year. Uh, with sense. everything, yeah. um, like my roses are blooming, spring is coming, the rosé just feels like... You know, I'm getting out of the pandemic. I've got yeah. this. <laughs> do, do you feel like the pandemic? Did the pandemic help or hurt hurt the business at all? 
It was a refocus. So I had a, a pretty significant direct-to-consumer retail operation here in St. Pete that I ended up retiring in February of last year. Oh. That's when we made the decision to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think we made the announcement, gosh, days before the first shutdown in Florida. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so <laughs> it was really good timing. And the reason why, why I needed to roll up these retail ops is because I needed to focus on distribution and there's just no way to, to do both. I couldn't you know, be handling mm -hmm. swimwear fittings and serving wine and, <laughs> you know, doing things like this and making right. sure that our operations were scaling properly and, and sourcing and all that good stuff. So where, where can people find, find your wine? We are in Total Wine. You can special order us at ABC. You can get us on our website. Um, and we've got uh, a, a handful of other places and you're in the Orlando area. Mm -hmm. um, is this, is this going primarily to folks in Florida or? Yeah. All over? I mean, it's, yeah. it's on our website and on podcasts, okay. but it's mostly focused on Florida. Okay. So in, in the Tampa Bay area, we've got, um, a bunch of really wonderful independent stores too, along with some other chains and Jacksonville, Miami area too. So just check our store locator, throw your zip code in mm -hmm. and uh, you can find us. Awesome. Excellent. Um, you know, just to, my last question personally is, you know, we, we, as we said, when we started out, you know, you're the first, um, you know, woman of color uh, to own a winery in the state of Florida going into it. Did you, did you know that? Did you know the significance of, of what you were attempting to do? Or was it just like, Oh, by the way, this is true about you now. I did not realize. I didn't know. Um, and then one of my friends who's a sommelier told me. And oh. um, I, I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'll be the last. I think that there are a lot of folks that are, um, you know, opening the doors and showing that, hey, this, this is a career path. You can do this too. Yeah. I mean, it, it, should, it does also make you feel pretty proud, I, I assume. I, I am. I am really proud of, of, um, of being the first and also, um, you know, showing folks who weren't expecting me to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. But, hey, here I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing it. Excellent. And so also, you know, you told us where we can find you in stores. Where can people find you online, social media, website? Feel free to shout all, right. all that out. Yes, please, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Mermosa Wines, M E R M O S A Wines, and uh, yeah, please message us with any questions. We're real people. Awesome! Can't <laughs> wait to drink your wine in the hot summer days of Florida. <laughs> oh yeah, grab the cans. They're perfect. <laughs> You've got cans? Oh yes. You haven't seen these? No. Oh yeah. Oh, those are oh, yeah. cute. They're they're. Perfect for the pool and the beach pool, and the park. In the park, <laughs> soccer practice. <laughs> do what you got to do. Awesome. Desiree, thank you so much for talking with us. You're such an inspiration. And I mean, it, it's a, such a bright, you know, bright days ahead for you. We're so excited for you. Thank you. I appreciate the support. Thanks for the highlight. Of course. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Florida Foodie. We'd also like to thank our guest, Desiree Noisette. You can find out more about her wines at mermosa.com or search Mermosa Wines on Facebook and Instagram. You can also find Candace Campos on social media. She's on Twitter. Just search at Candace News 6 and on Facebook, search Candace Campos News 6. Also, a big thank you to our technical producers, Derek Mosier and Ryan Haley. I'm the show's producer, Thomas Mates. Florida Foodie is available to download wherever you get your podcasts. Please take the time to rate and review us there as well. And you can find videos of all of our podcasts at clickorlando.com slash podcasts. Oh, 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 oh